Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We are taking hold of it, doing it. Thank you for the fruit that will come forth from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We are sharing with you on the subject of the mind. The last two messages, very important. Hopefully you heard them on how to obtain the mind of Christ and what is necessary and also the effects of evil in our mind, how the enemy would try to bring evil into us and the effects of them and how we need to deal with it and overcome it. Tonight we're going to talk about the practical conquering of the spiritual warfare that would come against your mind. And we begin in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, a very important scripture that we've mentioned each time. Casting down imaginations, imagination refers to mental reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If you are going to practically conquer the spiritual warfare that comes against your mind, you're going to have to do this scripture for sure. The enemy will work against your mind, bringing lies, things that are contrary to the Word of God, to deceive you and lead you away from the truth. Anything that comes that is a reason that is contrary to the Word of God must be cast down. Anything that comes to you that exalts itself against the knowledge of God must be cast down, and you must choose the knowledge of God, doing it, speaking it, walking in it, acting upon it. You also must master the bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When a negative thought comes to you that's contrary to the word, you need to deal with that. You just don't just ignore it. You need to conquer it. You bring it in captivity to the obedience of Christ. Otherwise, you replace it with the word of God to bring the word and have that in you so you do not give place to that lying thought. And as we see in verse 6, we're to be ready, have a readiness. This means prepared and ready to revenge all disobedience. Because this is the devil bringing disobedient thoughts against you. So you're to be ready to revenge this, avenge it. And this is when your obedience is fulfilled that it will be accomplished. Your obedience to what? Your obedience to casting down the reasonings. Get, casting down these things that exalt itself against the knowledge, anything contrary to the word, and you bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. God wants us to get our mind on the things of the word and make sure that nothing comes into our mind that is contrary to the word of God. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2, I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. What was wrong with them? Which walk into the way that was not good after their own thoughts. That means if you walk after your own thoughts and don't put the word of God first place in your thoughts to think about what the word says in every situation, you're walking in your own way. And if we're walking after our own thoughts, it's not good. God considers us a rebellious people. The Lord wants you to have him in all your thoughts. In Psalms chapter 10, verse 4, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts, meaning that's not what he should be doing. He shouldn't be having God and, you know, kicking God out of all his thoughts. He should be having God in all his thoughts. That shows you the fact that if you are going to walk in the ways of the, of the Word and you're going to have the mind of Christ and you're going to conquer every evil thing that would come against you, God must be in all your thoughts. And how that happens is by submitting your thoughts to the Word of God so that you walk in line with the Word. In Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. If your mind stayed on them, that means it's supported, upheld, leaning upon. Well, how can it be upon him? Because you're thinking on the word, what the word says in each situation. And notice it goes on and says, Because he trusteth in thee. That shows that you show that you trust in the Lord in the measure that your mind is stayed upon him, thinking on what his word says. 
as you think on what the Word says in each situation, the result will be He'll keep you in perfect peace. We can abide in peace. That means anything that takes us out of peace, that means the enemy's gotten to us somehow. We must not give place to the enemy. So we're going to talk practically about conquering the spiritual warfare against your mind. One thing that we must look at is when something comes to you that is contrary to the word, how do you need to deal with this? Matthew chapter 4, we see what Jesus did. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after it a hundred. When the tempter came to him, that's when the enemy comes with something, whatever it might be, into your mind that's contrary to the word. As he said, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. That he was supposed to prove that. He answered and said, It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's going to follow the word of God. He's not going to listen to anything that the devil says. And he spoke, it's written, what the scripture was to counter what the devil was trying to get him to do. We see in verse 5, the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. He said to him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, as it's written, he gives his, shall give his angels charge concerning thee, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. The devil can bring some truth that's in line with the word, even scripture, and then mix it together with a lie that then will still be deceptive and it's not of the Lord. Just because there's some truth doesn't mean that, well, it must be the Lord. There can be lies mixed in that cuts it off right there there. God doesn't ever bring anything that is not always in line with the truth. So, well, of course, what was the temptation? He goes on and, is, of course, was he supposed to ca uh, cast himself down? You know, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. Tempting God is what the temptation was. Jesus said unto him, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm not gonna tempt God. So he spoke to deal with that in order to conquer the temptation that came against him. Many people can get deceived because of things that come that are in line with the word or apparently, but then there's some things that are contrary to it. We've got to be ready to deal with anything. Anything that's not true, you know this has come from the devil. So we see in verse uh, 8. Again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain, showed them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said to him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. He's, all these kingdoms, just fall down and worship me. So he's trying to entice him. Yet the temptation is there. And Jesus, of course, answered it. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The way he conquered all of the temptations was bringing the scripture which was the answer to the temptation and what he should be thinking on or doing or believing in the situation. That's how you are going to overcome the temptations and conquer the spiritual warfare against your mind practically. You're going to address the lie that comes. You don't just ignore it. You need to come against it. You need to conquer it and cast it down. We're going to talk about common attacks coming against the mind and just examples of what you need to do. The devil may come to you, you have sickness and disease, and try to throw a lie into you, is God really a healer? Will he, you know, do you really think that God will really heal you? What are you gonna do about that? You need to not just deal with it in your own natural, you need to deal with it with the word of God. The word of God is the power of God that deals successfully with the temptations. Exodus 15, 26. He said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and do that, will do that which is right in his sight, will give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I'll put none of these diseases upon thee which thy brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's Jehovah Rapha, the covenant keeping name of the Lord, that he is one who will heal us. God wants us 
to understand that would answer this. Is God really a healer? He sure is. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And that's the covenant, declaring that I have a covenant right of healing. It's mine. It belongs unto me. Over in the New Testament, we see the fact that healing belongs to us. 1 Peter chapter 2, over in verse 24, speaking of what Jesus did for us, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Healing belongs to us. And we must understand that because of what Jesus accomplished, that means this means healing now belongs to us because of the stripes of Jesus, and we can receive. He is a healer. Another lie might come and say, well, yeah, I know he heals, but I don't know if he'll heal this sickness. He might heal some, some minor things, but what about this situation that I'm dealing with? Well, you've got to have the scripture ready to answer it. Psalms 103, verse 3. Knowing the word is going to be so important for you to conquer this warfare. Psalms 103, who he forgiveth all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases. He will heal all your diseases. So don't let the devil throw any lies in there to get you to doubt. The answer is giving the scripture that answers the, the lie that the devil brings into your mind. He is the one who heals all thy diseases. And another one will come and say, well, I know he heals some people, but I don't, I don't know if he'll heal me for sure. Well, you've got to be ready to deal with us successfully. Luke chapter 6, verse 17. Here's when the people came. Great multitude out of, it says here, came. He came down with them, stood in the plain, company of his disciples. Great multitude of people out of all Judea, Jerusalem, from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Well, was it going to get done for all of them? Look what it says down here. Also, they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And he says in verse 19, the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue, that's dunamis, power out of him, and healed them all. They all got healed. Jesus is the healer of everyone. He will heal you. As you walk in line with this word, of course, meet the conditions, do what is necessary, you use your faith to take hold of the promises, he will bring forth his healing for you. Or the devil might come along and try to say, well, I don't, is it really God's will for me to be healed? Matthew chapter 8, verse 2. See, many people believe God can do it, but will, is he really willing to do it for me? Matthew 8, 2. Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. He didn't doubt his ability to do it. He just said, is it your will? Do you really will? Well, Jesus put forth his hand, touched him, and he dealt with that lie immediately. I will. Knock that lie out right then and there. You need to be ready to knock out the lies of the devil that would come into your mind. Be thou clean. And he spoke the word. He spoke it into being, which is the way you bring things into being. You speak. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You can conquer all these lies that the devil brings against you. Deliverance. People say, well, I want someone else to pray for me to get me delivered. A lot of people are that way. Well, you, you know, we've got to teach people the fact that, yeah, people help you, but you've got to work out your own. And God, well, you've got to see yourself get delivered by doing what the Word says. Well, people say, you mean I can deliver myself through the power and the authority of God? That's right. Zechariah 2, verse 7, look what he says. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. You can deliver yourself out of any kind of captivity. He told you to deliver yourself because you are going to cast out the demons and drive them out. Remember what it says in Mark chapter 16, verse 17. This is written to all believers. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Shall they cast them out? That's you and me, all believers. You are to cast the demons out. So don't think that you can't cast them out. You can cast them out. Everybody needs to be working self-deliverance 
and casting out the demons to drive them out of every area of their life. And that's actually part of you working out your own salvation. In Philippians chapter 2, it means you and I have the responsibility to do this. It's not try to find somebody else to do everything for me. Philippians 2.12, Beloved, wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. The word work out is an imperative mood. That means it's saying you work out. It's a command to you and me. And we are to do it continuously. So God expects us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And the salvation of the Lord, that's deliverance, that's healing, that's bringing forth all aspects of the salvation of the Lord that he'll bring forth in your life. He wants us to be a doer of the word. Other people say, well, I want all these demons out right now. I just want them all gone immediately. Well, the Bible shows us from the Old Testament types that this is not going to be just one shot, cast them out, and everything's gone just like that. Exodus chapter 23, verse 30, indicates how the enemies were driven out in the Old Testament in order to be able to possess the promised land. People say, well, I don't see this process and this doing this in the New Testament. It's important that you understand the New Testament, things that are written, give the facts. The Old Testament, in many subjects, gives the details through the physical types and shadows of the spiritual realities. In other words, Satan is the enemy, but they had physical enemies in the, Old, in the Old Testament, but they're all a type of the evil spirits that are the enemies that you and I are dealing with. Remember, they went in and had to fight those enemies with a physical sword. Well, what do we fight with? A spiritual sword, which is our mouth speaking in line with the word. And when they went in, the Old Testament physical land that they were possessed is a type and shadow of the spiritual land that you and I possess, which are all the promises of God. So, from understanding that, we really see the process of deliverance in driving the enemies out to possess our promises, the spiritual promised land, as we see what they were doing to drive the physical enemies out to possess the, spirit, the physical promised land. And how was it done? It was little by little. Exodus 23, 30, By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. It will be a little by little process of systematically casting out the demons in area after area of your life that have come in from inheritance, your own sins, or victimization. And as you drive them out, the changes will come in your life. 2 Samuel 22, verse 38. This is David's psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance from his enemies. What did he do? He just did one shot and that was it. No. I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again. He didn't stop until I consumed them. Well, this was an ongoing fight. He continually was after them. I've consumed them and wounded them, but they could not arise. Yea, they're fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle, and them that rose up against me thou hast subdued under me. Otherwise, he got on the offensive and went after pursuing all the enemies to drive them out. Well, the devil will bring thoughts in your mind as well. I'm just kind of tired of casting out. I feel a little bit better, so, and they think that they're okay. No, you need to continually be casting out. Because the devil will come at you at a time, oftentimes, just you're kind of just by yourself and kind of a try to attack you on areas and you need to be ready to be dealing with that and also should be on the on continually de getting delivered as you're casting out daily here's a case look what this guy did second Samuel 23 9 Eleazar the son of Dodo the Aohite one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away I meant they're all gone but here he's alone and the enemies are coming after him. The devil will try to come after you when you're by just you and the enemies attacking you. What did he do? He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He arose and smote the Philistines. 
you need to meet fire with fire. When the enemies attack you, you attack them. You get that sword in operation, which is your mouth commanding those demons to come out of you in the name of Jesus. He arose and he smote the Philistines with his, until his hand was weary. If you keep on smite, smiting until your hand's weary, you've been doing a lot of smiting. How do we do it? With our mouth. You're going to make your mouth work and you're going to be casting out and casting out and casting out continually. His hand clave under the sword. How do you, what's that mean? He didn't let go of the sword physically. You don't let go of the sword spiritually, which is what? Your mouth. That means you keep your mouth working, commanding, 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 commanding. Every time you're speaking, you're releasing authority and power against those enemies and driving them out. The Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people return after him only to spoil. He smote the enemies. Don't think that the enemies are too big for you to take out. But sometimes the enemy will try to get you tired, get you faint. You know, maybe you don't see something happening immediately. And try to get you to give up. And he brings those thoughts into your mind. Just kind of back off of this. Try something else, you know. No, that's a mistake. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. Whatever you're sowing to is what you're going to reap from, meaning that you need to be sowing to the Spirit so you will reap of the Spirit the good things that God wants. And you need to win the battle in the Spirit and drive the enemies out till they're gone. Sometimes the changes don't happen while you're doing that, but they will down the road. Notice what he says. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Don't get weary. Don't get weary engaging in the, the spiritual fight of casting out the enemies. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. The devil tries to get you to get weary, get tired of casting out, get faint. Don't give place to that. You're giving place to the enemy and he's trying to wear you down. In fact, you need to remember, you need to cast them all out. Well, I feel a little bit better. Well, no, that doesn't mean you stop. You continue until they're all gone. Or you say, well, I haven't seen any changes yet. Well, you're, as you're coming out, the demons are coming out, you're winning the battle in the spirit, things are happening. What are you supposed to do? Numbers 33, 53, you shall disp dispossess the inhabitants of the land there and dwell therein, for I've given you the land to possess it by driving out the previous inhabitants. Verse 55, if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, means you don't continue to do it. Then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them, that means you're letting them stay in you, shall be pricks in your eyes, thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. You're born again. You've come into the spiritual land. But the enemies are beating you up because you haven't driven them all out. They can be pricks in your eyes, thorns in your sides, and vex you, harass you, cause all kinds of problems in your life. That's why we need to be aggressively attacking the enemy. So anything that tries to get you to get tired, to get weary, get faint, back off, you get these scriptures before you say, no, no, I'm going to smite them all. I know I'm going to reap in due season if I faint not. I know that if I don't drive them all out, they're going to continue to cause me problems in my life and bring destructive effects. Lies will come to your mind thinking that the word will not work. Well, you know, you've tried that, so go try something else. No, that's a lie. The devil will try to get you to do that to get you a divided heart, get you double-minded, remember, get you unstable. Jeremiah 1.12, look what it says. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Or this means I will be watching over my word, as Young's brings out. I will watch over my word to perform it. He will perform it. Don't ever think that God will not perform his word. His word will be performed as you are doing it and putting him in operation. You know, the devil a lot many times say, well, look at what's going on in your situation. Look at the natural. Look at your physical body or look at this or look at that. He, he always tries to get you somehow out of the spirit Get you looking at what's going on in the natural so you won't continue to see things of what are happening in the realm of the spirit. Look what it says in 1 2 Corinthians 4.18. This is your answer anytime he tries to get your focus off to the ways of the spirit. 
We look not at the things that are seen. We look at the things that are not seen. We are taking aim at the promises, and we are taking aim at the devils to cast them out. We are taking aim at the things we don't see because we know the spiritual realm controls and dominates the natural realm. The things that are seen are temporal, and they're all going to change. They're all changeable. But the things that are not seen are eternal. That's where we have to deal with things. You have to win the battle in the spirit, take casting out the enemies, and also speaking the promises into being to see God bring things forth. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight, which is external or outward appearance. We're not going to be moved and walk by what's going on in the natural. We're going to walk by faith in line with the Word of God. The enemy, though, will bring lies to you and try to take away your hope, get you to feel, you know, lose your hope in some way. And he, off, he does that because he gets your mind off of the Word and having a confidence in what God will do for you. You got to be guarding yourself because remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for. You have hope, and your faith brings the hopes into being. If you don't have your hope, which is a confident expectancy of what God will do, your faith isn't going to do anything. So the devil will attack you in the area of your mind to try to get you out of in hope, which is a confident expectancy. And he works in the soulish realm, remember, because hope affects the soul. Psalms 42, verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Otherwise, anything that's coming into your soul that's causing a disquieting, causing a, a troubling you some way in something, that's the enemy working. Hope thou in God, for I should yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Don't let him get to you in your soulless realm and get you cast down, depressed, discouraged, disappointed, whatever it might be. You need to maintain hope, a confident expectancy, regardless of the circumstances. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. This is talking about what Abraham did, the God kind of faith, to see the victory. Who against hope believed in hope. Why was there some reason to be against the hope? Well, it's because... It says he wasn't weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead, which is about 100 years old, and yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's 100 years old, and her womb's dead. And the natural, there was every reason to not have hope. But against a confident expectancy, he believed in the confident expectancy that he might become the father of many nations, according to what? That which was spoken. Otherwise, where is your focus? The Word. What the Word says. He said, so shall thy seed be, meaning you are going to be the father of many nations. So his focus need to be upon that, to bring and see this come to pass. See, what's spoken it was not automatic. He had to, it was a promise that God gave him, but he had to have confidence to see it come to pass through his faith. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Otherwise, the promises aren't automatic. Remember, there's a conditional on all of them. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, was strong in faith, giving glory to God, fully persuaded that what he'd promised he was able to perform. And he saw it come to pass. Sarah, remember, she had to get on board. It meant she had to get in faith as well and put her faith in operation to see the seed come forth. Hebrews 11, 11, through faith also Sarah herself received lombano, took hold of dunamis, as the word is, power to conceive seed. She took hold of the power of God to conceive seed. And she saw that she, got del she was delivered of a child when she was past age. And nothing to do in the natural. It was God doing it because she judged him faithful who had promised. Her eyes had to get on the promise as well. You've got to get on the promise and then put your faith continually in operation and maintain hope. You've got to have a confident expectancy in order to see things come to pass. Remember, hope, Hebrews 6, verse 19. 
Hope is the anchor of your soul. Remember, the devil attacks you in the soulless realm. He wants to get you double-minded. He wants you to get too sold in some way. This is your soul to be anchored in the Word of God, that nothing will move you whatsoever. And we saw in James chapter 1, verse 7, Let not that man think that he shall lombano take hold of anything of the Lord. Why? Because a double-minded man who's wavering is unstable in all his ways. In other words, you've got to maintain hope. That's very important. And you've got to be ready to deal with anything tries to take you away from the confident expectancy of what God will do for you. Romans 15, verse 4, look what he says. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. How do you get hope? Through the Word. Remember the Word is written in your heart, producing faith, and written in your mind, producing hope. You must keep the Word before your mind. You cannot let the devil get to you in your mind. You must guard your mind and keep the Word first place and never let yourself get double-minded. And of course, He wants you to come to the place where you're abounding in hope. I mean, you're not just kind of holding on to make it, you know. No, Romans 15, 13, the God of hope. He's called a God of hope, a God of confident expectancy. It's the word El Peace. It means a confident expectancy. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That is evidence that you really are on target with hope. You've got peace and you have joy in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, if you lose your joy and you lose your peace, you lost your hope. The devil got to you. We must maintain hope. The Word will give you, the Scriptures give you hope. And the God of hope will fill you with joy and peace that you abound in hope as your eyes are upon the Word and you're working your faith. The devil will come and bring lies to you and try to tell you things and, you know, kind of get, wear you down and about being confident of what God will produce for you. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 26. Don't ever let your confidence be turned away from the Lord. Proverbs 3, 26. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken or captured. So you've got to love the Lord, your confidence. Don't get confidence in anything else. You get your eyes on the Lord, who's the performer of his word, which means anything that you do in the human nature realm, in the flesh, will produce nothing. In fact, Paul came to this understanding. Look what he says, Philippians 3.3. 3. We are of the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. None. Don't have confidence in the flesh. People have, get confidence in the flesh all the time. They try two different ways. They try on all these different things. No confidence in the flesh. Your confidence is in God. Of course, the devil will try to get to you to get you to turn away. And essentially, what do you do? You cast away your confidence, which is a big mistake. That's why the answer, the scriptural answer for that is Hebrews 10.35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. You will be rewarded for your maintaining confidence. And then he tells you what you have need of, for you have need of patience. Being steadfast in the soul, hupomone is steadfast as in the soul, keeping your mind steadfast and doing what God wants, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive, which this is the word komidzo, which means to carry off the promise. You're going to have to keep doing the Word of God in the midst of the situation. Never let your confidence be cast away. You have need to be steadfast in the midst. That's keeping your hope st st steadfast, the patience of hope, steadfastness of hope, as you keep your faith applied to bring the promises into being. Another thing that's important is you do need this joy, this rejoicing. One of the things the devil really attacks and seems to be successful in a lot of Christians' lives is bringing all kinds of thoughts and feelings into you that takes you out of your joy. And where's your source of joy? The Word. In fact, let's look at that first. 
Where do we get this joy from? Is it from your circumstances? Everything going good? No. It has nothing to do with that. Here's where the joy comes. It's the Word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. You got this word in you. You took this into you. You eat it, it comes into you. You digest it. And the word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Do you have joy and rejoicing in the midst of whatever you might be dealing with right now? If your eyes are on the Word and you're operating according to the Word in you, you will have that joy and rejoicing. And that's what God wants. The devil will attack your joy. That's why even when temptations come, what's it say immediately when you're, fall, when you're enveloped? James 1, 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. First of all, it doesn't mean you have already done it. It's not talking about that. First of all, fall means to fall into as being encompassed by it. Otherwise, it's surrounding you and you could fall into it if you give place to it. The other reason why it doesn't mean you automatically do it is because it's a conditional statement. It's a subjunctive mood. It would be literally saying, count all joy when you might fall into diverse temptations. You're not supposed to fall into them. If you watch and pray, you won't enter into it. But if you do... Don't give, let your joy go, because God's going to bring you out of this thing. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, the devil is attacking your faith, trying to stop it. And joy protects your faith, see. It's going to work and bring into operation steadfastness. That means you've got to be maintaining hope. Steadfastness, patience is steadfastness of hope. Let steadfastness, patience, have her perfect, perfecting work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. Well, that's not automatic. It depends on whether you're going to do the things that need to be done, perfect, entire, wanting nothing. You may be, you may see this happen. This, again, is a subjunctive mood, meaning it's all conditional upon you making sure you're maintaining the joy, you're maintaining the steadfastness on the word, which means hope, in order to see your faith come through to victory. And God will do this for you. So we need joy. So it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Philippians 4, remember the Philippian letter is in Philippi, that's when Paul and Silas were in the jail. Looked like they, uh, their ministry was derailed. No, they're gonna get their eyes on the Lord. They were praising and praying and singing unto God and witnessing, obviously, because the jailer ended up here, heard about being saved and what to do. And God sent an earthquake and opened up the door and they got delivered out of that thing. But look what it says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. It talks about rejoicing in there several places because that's important in the midst of attacks you must keep a rejoicing spirit about you. 1 Thessalonians 5 sets it straight. Rejoice evermore. That's an easy one to remember. Two words. Rejoice evermore. Well, I'm going to rejoice evermore. Choose to rejoice has nothing to do with your circumstances. But again, it's not you just manufacturing this in your, in yourself. Why, why would you rejoice? Because your eyes are on the word, you're putting your faith in operation. God is working to bring the promise or destroy the enemies, whatever it is. God is your victory. That's why you maintain a rejoicing. Rejoice evermore to make sure that you don't give the place to the enemy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, your place of fortified, place of protection. We must do what he says. Anything that tries to get you to weary and give up and throw in the towel or not continue or not do the things you should be doing. No, that's the enemy attacking you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord, which is having a, this is the word which would be like hope and expectancy, confident expectancy in the Hebrew, shall renew their strength. The attacks may come, God will renew your strength. You'll mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What do eagles do? 
They don't fly in storms. They fly above the storms. They conquer what comes at them. You're going to run and not get weary. You're going to run this race to possess the promise. You're going to walk and not faint. There is no drawing back. There is no getting weary or fainting. No, not at all. We're not going to faint ever. Look what it says in Luke 18. This is, these scriptures ought to be before you. 18.1, he spake a parable unto him to this end, that men ought always to pray at all times. Ought means necessary. It's the word translated must. The majority of the times, 58 times, we talked about this word many times, men must always pray and not to faint. We don't faint. We continue to pray because every time you're praying, Whatever it might be, whether it's prayers of authority or praying to take hold of promises, you're putting the power of God in operation. You're bringing God on the scene to bring things into manifestation. That's what God wants. Thoughts of discouragement come to you. Now, they're all rooted in fear. Why would you be discouraged? I'm just trying to get you a fearful that maybe I won't see the promise. Maybe. This won't change. Maybe this won't get better, whatever the situation might be. Maybe it won't go away. Don't listen to that. It's the devil trying to deceive you. Deuteronomy 1.21 Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. He set the promises before us. Go up and possess it. Possess it means to, this is the word, Yarash, Strong's, speaks of it as occupying by driving out previous inhabitants which is all pointing towards you're going to possess this by casting out all the devils. As the Lord God of thy fathers said unto thee, fear not, neither be discouraged. Don't be afraid. The devil will bring fear at you. Or he, discouragement is all form of fear because discouragement means a loss of courage. Dis means a loss. You can't have a loss of courage. You've got to be strong and courageous. Remember what the requirements were to go in and possess the land? In Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous, so you, don't, so you observe to do according to all the law. And don't turn to the right or left. Verse 9, have I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. The Lord thy God's with thee whithersoever thou goest. You're going to be strong and of a good courage. You can't lose the courage. Discouragement is taking away your courage. No. In fact, what's the answer? Even you say, well, the, look what the devil did. Well, look what the devil did here in 1 Samuel 30 came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire and taken the women captives that were therein, slew not any, neither, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and men came to the city. Behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, sons, daughters were taken captives. Oh, the enemy showed up. What's the answer? Get discouraged? No. Even though... David was greatly distressed because the people were wanting to blame him and stone him. Of course, they, didn't, they weren't operating the way they should at all because all the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and daughters. What did David do, though? He encouraged himself in the Lord as God. He took courage in by having his focus on the Lord instead of let the circumstances sink him. If your eyes are on what, hap what has happened, you'll lose your courage and you'll get discouraged. If your eyes are on the Lord of what He wants you to do, knowing He will give you the victory, you encourage yourself in the Lord. How are you going to do that? Through the Word. Thinking on what the Word says. So what does David do? He goes in and inquires of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them without fail, recover all. Get on the offense. Go after them. Smite them all. Anything the devil has come in to steal in your life, you get on the offense. You go after them. Smite them all and drive them all out. Look what he says. You're going to pursue them. That means run after with hostile intent. You're going to overtake them all and without fail, recover all. That's exactly what he did. He ran after them and he recovered everything. 
This is what God wants you to do. You've got to be ready for these things. You, you get these scriptures before, you'll be encouraged. If you don't, you look at the circumstances, you'll get discouraged real easy. The enemy will sink you. You cannot allow those things to happen in your life. In situations where someone did something evil to you and you need to forgive, well, Matthew chapter 6, you said, well, I don't feel like forgiving. Or I forgave him and then I still have these feelings of unforgiveness. Hmm. Well, that's coming from the demons of unforgiveness that are in you when you were in unforgiveness. What's the answer? Anytime anything that comes in your mind of not forgiving, holding unforgiveness, thoughts of going out of forgiveness into unforgiveness, whatever it might be, you better get the scriptures before you. Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. That's good news. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Uh -huh. That means I'm abiding in my sins if I don't forgive. You must choose to forgive. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has nothing to do with consequences from what people have done. They ruined my life, whatever. Hey, today's a new day and God can restore everything. What's past is past. Let it go. Forgive, otherwise you're going to stay in sin. And God will not be able to work for you because of the fact that you are not going to be forgiven of your own. Well, I'll just pray and God will get me out of this. Now, look what's going to happen here. Mark 11, 25. When you stand praying, he does say forgive. I thought if I could just pray, that'd solve my all problems. I don't have to really forgive. No, you're going to have to forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you don't forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is mandatory. If you don't forgive, what's going to happen to you? Well, you're going to end up being turned over to the tormentors. Matthew 18, verse 35, and this is talking about specifically about a brother. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts, it's got to be from your heart, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. And the verse before tells you what happens if you don't. This guy got delivered to the tormentors. Why? This is the case, remember, where he got forgiven of his great big debt, which is God forgiveness of all of our sins. And yet he wouldn't forgive someone of their small debt which would be us not forgiving someone of whatever their sin might have been against us. If you don't, you're going to be turned over to the tormentors. And this has got to be genuine forgiveness from your heart. How am I going to do that? In obedience to the Word of God, because it's what's right. Otherwise, you're going to abide in the areas of sin. Well, the devil brings you guilt. Well, I got guilt over all the things I've done in the past. Does God condemn you with guilt? No. Are you going to be ready to deal with it? You've got to deal with it. John chapter 8, verse 11. This is the case where the woman was taken in the very act of committing adultery. And, you know, the law said about stoning them. And Jesus said, he without, first, without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> and they all had to drop their stones and go away. Well, all that was left was Jesus now. In verse 10, Jesus lifted up himself, saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? They're all gone. Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Well, what about God, though? Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. God will not condemn you. He will correct you, but he will not condemn you. Go and sin no more. He's correcting and he's telling her what to do. You go and you sin no more. We must receive the correction and not walk in sin any longer. No condemnation. Do not let the devil bring up the past sins and beat you up over the head about them. Romans 8.1 There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. We're going to walk after the Spirit and lie with the Word. 
That means we're walking in his ways. No condemnation. We should have no condemnation or guilt. If you have forgiven, if you have confessed your sins, you have let go of whatever it might be, you are forgiven. Someone tries to say, you know, well, you have these feelings, you said you had these feelings of unforgiveness, so that means you must not have forgiven. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. If you forgave, you could have feelings of unforgiveness, thoughts of unforgiveness coming from the demons that are in you that haven't been cast out yet. You are not, you're also going to need to cast out the demons to drive them out, remember. And guard yourself so you don't yield to anything to come back in. So, no guilt. God does not condemn, but he will convict and he will correct. And he expects us to, of course, receive his word and do what he says. And of course, the devil will come at you and try to get you worried about a situation, concerned about a situation, anxious about a situation. That's the one he works all the time at people. What does the Bible say? You've got to be ready to deal with it. Philippians 4, 6, be careful, be anxious for nothing. Well, if you knew my situation, you'd have anxiety. And if you're looking at the situation, but if you're looking at the promise, you can be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Have concern about nothing. No. Does that mean I'm just going to stand here in limbo? No, you're going to do something proactive, which is what? In everything, by prayer and supplication. Otherwise, I'm going to put God in operation. I'm going to pray. Whatever mean a prayer it is, means a prayer. Whether it's prayers of authority or praying the word to take hold of promises, I'm not going to just do nothing. I'm going to put God in operation with thanksgiving. In this case, letting your request or your legal demands, itama, meaning a legal demand of what's due you, be made known unto God. You're going to pray the word of God and take hold of the promise with thanksgiving to start bringing this into being. When you, when you obviously don't see that happening at the moment, and anxiety is trying to overtake you and get you concerned. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That tells you something. If you've lost your peace, the anxiety or the concern or the worry must have gotten through to you somehow. You need to get rid of that. And of course, what's the answer? Well, you do have to get rid of it. What do, you, what do I do? I cast it on the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. All means all. Cast every care, worry, anxiety upon the Lord about whatever the situation is, about the finances, about the health, about this, about that, whatever it might be. For he careth for you. You cast it on the Lord. And again, that doesn't mean you're going to sit around and do nothing. Some people like cast it on the Lord and then they're doing nothing. No, remember, you put your faith in operation to take the promise and you put your faith in operation to conquer the enemies. You're going to put God in operation. You don't just sit around and do nothing. Or you're going to see the devil discontinue to work destructive things. Because you ought to understand, care and worry and anxiety is going to do a number on you. If you don't deal with it, Look what it says in Luke 21, verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your heart be overcharged. It's going to affect your heart where you believe and where your faith is. And it tells you it's with surfeiting. The guy's got a hangover because of drinking. And this is intoxication of any type. But not only those, you think, well, yeah, I can see how that can affect you. Cares also will affect your heart. It'll overcharge your heart. Cares will worries, anxieties about this life, things that are going on. Do not let yourself get full of care, worry, anxiety, concern. It's the same thing. People say, I'm not, full. okay, I won't be anxious, but I am concerned. It's the same thing. You just kind of watered it down. No, nope. no care, worry, anxiety, concern. We're casting it all on the Lord. Say, well, what do I do? You're going to be watchful of what the enemy's doing, and you're going to be putting God in operation you can be watchful when there's even negative things going on, but you're going to put God in operation to deal with what's going on, to conquer the enemies. See, there's no reason for us to have care, worry, and anxiety when you put God in operation. God will solve the problem and bring you out of it. Also, what else will care, worry, and do? It'll stop the word from working. It won't work for you. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. 
He that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world cares. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. The other account it talks about the word becomes unfruitful, it becomes unfruitful. Otherwise, you can't let the cares of this world get only it will choke out the word from producing the fruit and bringing forth the promises in your life. You've got to learn to guard yourself. Then a the lie comes and say, well, I don't know if God really wants to bless me or not. Don't listen to those lies. Say, well, what's the answer? I need, I need something. Well, you're going to look, all you have, Acts chapter 3 sets it pretty straight in verse 26. Jesus came, what did he come to do? Acts 3, 26, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Jesus came to bless you. He'll bring his blessings upon you. Now, there is some, got a, some uh, conditions in turning away every one of you from his iniquities, you know. It's not going to happen if you're going to continue to walk in sin. You do have to turn away from all the iniquities. I and mean, you continue to get angry and get frustrated, get upset all the time, and keep on yielding to the devil left and right and attitudes and things you do, you're, you're shutting down God from working at all in your life. He's coming to bless you, and he will bless us if we will do what he says. But you know, that also is conditions. Remember, every, every promise has conditions. Deuteronomy 28. If you hearken diligently on the voice of the Lord your God to observe and do all his commandments, which I com command you this day, the Lord will set thee high above all nations of the earth. And notice, all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. They can't, you can't even get away from them. Well, I'm, if I can't get away from them, What's the problem? I want them to, you know, get on me, <laughs> overtake me. There must be a problem. Not meeting the conditions. Not hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. Letting the enemy come in in some way. You know, we meet the conditions, God will perform his word. And he'll do it in all areas. Look what it says in verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. That's prosperity. In all thy settest thy hand unto. He wants you blessed in everything you do. He'll bless you in the land which the Lord thy God gives you. Verse 12. The Lord shall open unto thee as good treasure, the heaven to give the rain and the land and the season, to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, thou shalt not borrow. I mean, we're talking about God's blessings will come on you in all aspects of life. If we read through here, he's blessed in the basket, blessed in the store, blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in everything you do. Because of hearkening diligently unto the voice of the Lord. Well, I've been seeing all these curses. I don't understand why all these curses. Well, it must be just, that's just going to happen, I guess. No, that's another lie the devil will bring. If you're having destructive things or have happened, there is a reason for it. It's not God doing evil things to you, remember. He's a good God. It's the devil working. What's withheld your, good, your, your blessings? What's withheld things are your sins and iniquities is what's withheld the good things from us. Proverbs 26, 2, the last part of the verse says, The ca curse causeless shall not come. All curses, which is anything evil that's happening in your life in any aspect, whether it's sickness or disease or poverty or lack or hindrances or whatever it might be, there's a cause for it. The cause is sin. Now, it may not even be your sin. It could be inherited generational iniquity curse from the sins of the forefathers, and you're just being affected by it. And until you cast out those demons, you're not going to get free of the curse. That's why you've got to understand deliverance. That's why most all the body of Christ, because they've rejected deliverance, they're all under the curse. They aren't getting free of any of the inherited generational curses that have come in from their inheritance, their own sins, and all these things. We need to understand there is a cause for a curse. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 15. So you've got to have the answers for everything so you don't get blown away by lies. Well, I understand why there's curses. It shall come to pass in verse 28, verse, chapter 28, verse 15. If thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe do all his commandments, his statutes which I command you this day, all these curses shall come on thee and overtake you. You can't get away from them. That man, a curse must have come upon me because of some sin somewhere, whether it's inheritance or my own sins or victimization, so I need to deal with that and start conquering what happened. I need to confess my sins, of course, 
receive forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteousness, but I also need to remit the sins of other people, let go of what's happened, and forgive all these things, let go of resentments, bitterness, so forth. But I'm also going to remit the sins of the forefathers and cast out all the demons that have come in from however they came in so I can get rid of these curses. At the same time, remember, God's given you a choice. I mean, you yourself might have made some wrong choices that caused these things to come on you. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Your choice, your will, you've got a free will. You can choose the way that leads death, or you can choose the way that brings cursing. We need to choose life and choose the blessing, the things that God wants us to choose. Praise God. Well, the devil will come and he'll try to tell you, well, you're not going to get the victory. He'll bring those thoughts to you. Well, you've got to be ready. What are you going to do? You can't get sunk. You can't get in fear. You can't get sad. You can't get depressed. You can't think, well, I don't know what will happen. Maybe I'll try something else. All these kind of things. No. And all these things were more than conquerors to him to love us, meaning to be completely victorious, what this means. You must know that God wants you completely victorious. And look at the promise of what he'll do, if you meet the conditions, of course. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God, talking about the Father, who is giving unto us, that's what the word is, the present tense in the Greek, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You're putting him in operation. He's the word. And also when you use the name of Jesus, you're using the authority. So whether you're speaking the word or using your authority, you're putting the Lord Jesus Christ in operation. And he's going to get, God's going to give you the victory as you put him in operation. Say, well, I know you can get victory sometimes, but I don't know if I can do it in this time. You've got to conquer those lies. First, 2 Corinthians 2.14, 4, important scripture. Thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ. That doesn't mean win a few and lose a few. That means win them all. That means triumph in everything. You've got to have that kind of mentality. I will triumph in every situation. God will cause me to triumph and get the victory as I am doing what the word says. You need to do this. You say, well, I, you know, it seemed like I had a lot of tax. We need to get the angels in operation. Put the angels in, you're going to put the angels in operation through your prayer. God's going to do it. Remember what Jesus did? You say, well, I seem like I've had, they I'm not being protected very well here. Well, what did Jesus do? Matthew 26, 53, this illustrates or shows in his statement what he must have done all the time up to this when he finally was giving his hand, in, himself into the hands of the enemy to take him to the cross for the purpose of redemption. He says, Thinkest now, thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he'll, he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. They'll come on the scene and take care of all these devils that are driving these people. You can put, see, the, God, the Father send the angels on your behalf to minister for you. And remember what these angels are. Hebrews 1.14, you've got to have these scriptures before you. Are they not all ministering spirits, angels, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? You are an heir of salvation. They will minister for you. But not automatically. You've got to put them in operation. You've got to pray for the Father to send those angels and or be confessing the word. Because remember, what do the angels do? as it says over in Psalms 103. You've got to know these scriptures, because if not, the enemy will just take you down, and you will not have been successful in defeating his attacks coming against your mind. Psalms 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel, or are strong and mighty in manifest power. Literally, it means that, what do they do? They do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. Well, when you're speaking the word, Jesus takes the word and confesses it before the angels. And what do the angels do? Hearken to the voice of the word. Who's going to perform the word? The angels are performing the word of God, doing his commandments, carrying these things out. You need to have confidence in what God will do for you. Praise God. 
We've got to deal with every attack that will come against us. Sin. Are you ready to deal with attacks that come against you? <clears throat> Maybe you've got a sin that so easy besets you. Romans chapter 6, verse 2. God forbid, how, are, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Where am I dead to sin in? In spirit, because you've got a new spirit. Can you sin in your soul? Yeah. Can you sin in your body? Of course, because sin dwells in your body. Remember? So what's the answer? You operate in the spirit? You don't have to sin any longer because you walk by the spirit. That's why we come down to verse 11. You reckon yourselves to be dead indeed in the sin because I live according to the spirit. I don't live by my physical body or carnal mind anymore. No. We're living by the spirit, by what the word says. You're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. No, that means I'm in Christ. I'm in a position of authority. I'm seated in heavenly places far above all principality, power, and might. I have authority and dominion. I have an inheritance that belongs to me. Let not sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the less thereof. That's why you have to crucify the flesh daily and not let those lusts of the flesh rise up and get you operating in them. That's how sin operates. Because you have to obey it, though. You have to obey it and yield to it. Neither yield your members, instruments of unrighteousness and of sin. Don't yield any of your members to let the enemy come in. What you hear, what you see, what you think upon, what you speak, what you're walking after, what you put your hands to, all these things, what you're thinking on in your mind. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, your members as instruments of, unrighteous, of, of righteousness unto God. And then he says in verse 16, know ye not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. We can't be yielding to the devil. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, whether you realize it or not, if you're not obeying and doing exactly what the word says, you could be yielding to the devil left and right, even though you're born again. And it'll produce death. We need to be yielded to obedience that produces righteousness in our life. So we walk in the ways of the Lord. You can conquer all sin. You need to get rid of the sin that so easily besets you. Don't think that you can't conquer every sin. Lay aside every weight, he says, and the sin that so easily besets you. And then we come to verse 4. You have not resisted on the blood, striving against sin. You need to fight against that sin. You need to strive against it. Whatever it is. We're not going to let it have place. Also, in conjunction with laying aside this thing, you're going to run with steadfastness. That means you're maintaining hope. The race set before me. And where are your eyes? Not wandering every which way about what's all going on. Looking, which means turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something. Where are your eyes fixed? On Jesus. How are my eyes fixed on Jesus? when I'm thinking on what the Word says, and I'm putting the Word in operation. He's the author and the finisher, the developer of my faith, as I'm operating my faith and working my faith to see God bring forth the promises in my life. You've got to know that God will bring you the victory. God wants us to be getting our mind on the Lord. Now people say, well, I don't feel like God's with me. Well, what are you going to do in that situation? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and you're content, be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. That's going to be the promise. You know, some people, though, they run around saying, God will never leave you and never forsake you. Is that a true statement, just to make that statement? If that's the case, then once saved, always saved is true. Oh, whoa. When we look at the word leave here, it's a subjunctive mood verb. When we look at the word forsake, that is a subjunctive mood verb. You don't hear anybody talk about that when they bring this scripture up. Meaning, this is a conditional statement. You can't say, God will never leave you or forsake you. Flat statement 
if that's the case, nobody's ever going to have any problems. They're going to they're be with God forever. No. He might never leave you, and he might never forsake you, as long as you meet the conditions. That's a lying teaching in the body of Christ. That destroys that once saved, always saved lie again by looking at the truth of the Word of God. We've got to look at what the Word says. See, you've got to get the Word in you exactly, too. You say, well, I thought that was what the Word said. Well, you must not have looked up everything, and you didn't have it quite right. That's what's happened. All these false teachings out there, they didn't get the truth on things. There's a problem. God wants us to conquer every attack that's against us. As you get the Word, put the Word in you. Hear the Word, do the Word, walk in the Word. Get the Word, get the Scriptures that answer whatever's coming at you. And that's where your focus is. And then, of course, you attack the demons that are bringing that at you, and you replace the word, the, the lie, with the truth. And then you also do what's necessary to start putting God in operation. Remember, like, say, be anxious for nothing, cast your care upon the Lord, but I'm going to pray the word to put him in operation. Or casting out the demons, you know. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, not, not sufficient just to, to, the enemy came in, stole your city, took everything, and, you know, and, well, I'm just going to encourage myself in the Lord, and God will somehow work something out. <laughs> no, he sought the Lord, and God, what do I do here? God said, pursue, get after these enemies, recover all. You know, pursue, overtake, without fail, you recover all. Otherwise, you're going to be proactive doing something. God's going to want, you're going to be putting your faith in operation, and you're going to have maintained hope because you've got the promise, but you're going to be putting your faith operation and releasing God to bring the promise at the same time, you're conquering all the enemy's attacks against you. See, some people just, I mean, they, 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 they con kind of conquer the ten enemy's attacks, but they don't put their faith in operation to see things come to pass. Otherwise, the devil just kind of nullifies you and gets you kind of fall back instead of being aggressive. No, we're supposed to take hold of every promise. We're to cast out every devil. We're to continually put God in operation to see victory. Any attacks that the enemy brings is trying to weaken you and stop you from moving forward. If he can get you out of hope, then he knows your faith will do nothing. But a lot of times it just kind of shuts them down. Remember when they came and they, they, they brought their false counsel and Nehemiah and they stopped the building, they weakened the guys and stopped the building of the wall. <laughs> Until they finally got on board and started to do what they needed to do. You can't ever let anything shut you down from staying in faith and moving forward to conquer the enemies and take hold of the promise. You don't let anything stop your mouth. Your mouth continues to confess the word, speak the word, cast out the devils, keep that sword, get mouth, word going forth out of you. You just stay on the offensive and stay operating in faith, praying without ceasing. You see what God wants. This is how you're going to conquer the spiritual warfare that comes against your mind. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of what I'm to do to conquer practically the spiritual warfare that comes against my mind. I will do what the Word says. I will speak the Word. It is written to conquer the lie, I will bring the Word of God into my mind so I maintain hope. I will continue to put my faith in operation and do what God says in taking hold of the promise and in casting out the demons and driving out the enemies so I get the victory. I thank you. I will make sure I conquer everything that comes against my mind. And I will not let the enemy get me to draw back or faint or shut me down from operating in what I'm supposed to do of attacking the enemies, taking all the promises. I thank you. I will conquer the spiritual warfare against my mind. I will have the mind of Christ. I will maintain steadfastness of hope, confident expectancy, and I will see the mind of Christ prevailing in me, 
And I will see the promises come to pass as I continually work my faith. Thank you, Lord. I will conquer everything that comes into my mind from this point forward as I am a doer of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This means, of course, you've got to get the scriptures. You've got to know what the scriptures to do the answer to it. If you don't, you've got to get in the word and find it. But then you've got to do what it says, put it in operation, and also do the things all that is necessary to continue to see God bring what he wants and maintain that hope, faith, spiritual warfare, all-out attack, doing what's necessary, putting God in operation to bring the victory, and he will do it. Father, I thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. Thank you that we'll be hearers and doers of this word and practically conquer the spiritual warfare against our mind. Thank you for much fruit and victory as we are hearers and doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.